morning at this very early hour of the day. So I'm here to talk about visualization and journalism for vignettes. Uh, so what are these vignettes? I'm hoping there's something for everyone. I realize there's quite a diverse audience uh, with people from many backgrounds. Um, so I'm going to start out with a tale of two tools. Uh, these are tools that uh, my research group was involved in that were created specifically for journalists. Um, and one of the things I'll be talking about as I walk you through these tools is their relationship to a shared framework of methods that are very interdisciplinary uh, that we've developed in my own group um, in terms of how to think about visualization design with collaboration. How could collaboration work? Uh, what are some of the roles and rewards? How is it that both sides can get a win out of that collaboration? Um, and also a framework for reasoning about the design and evaluation of visualizations. How can we design things? How can we reason about whether or not they're working? And particularly to get people to think about visualization not as a little icing that you add on to the cake at the end to prettify things, but much more as something where you're about effectiveness. Um, so these two tools are basically aiming at different parts of that design space. Um, one uh, overview uh, is aimed at the investigation space. So in the language of visualization, it's an exploratory tool. Uh, in the language of journalism, that's for uh, investigation. And then Timeline Curator is a tool that's much more aimed at the explanatory case. So a tool for presentation where the end user is your journalistic audience. I'll also have two cautionary tales uh, where I'm going to try to give you some advice on some really severe pitfalls where a lot of people's intuitions lead them wrong when it comes to actually how it is that we might use visualization. Um, and these lessons learned, one is about the challenges of color, and the other is on the difficulties of depth. So that's the ride we're going to be on. Fasten your seatbelts. Let us launch in. I'm going to start by saying my own definition for visualization and some of the motivations for when we would use it. So uh, the definition in my book is computer-based visualization systems, and I'm going to say viz for short, so I save many syllables over the next hour. Um, so viz systems provide visual representations of data sets designed to help people carry out tasks more effectively. So, and in particular, when do we use it? Not all the time. It's suitable when there's a need to augment the capabilities of the human instead of replacing them with something that's a completely computational method to make some sort of decision. So Viz is suitable when there's this human in the loop and they need the details. Why would this be? It's that you don't know exactly what you want. You don't know which question to ask in advance. You could write a program if you knew you were asking question A. But what if there are 100 possible questions or 10,000 possible questions? That's the place where you often want a lot of exploratory analysis, sometimes for the long term. So the classic use case of Viz is, for example, Exploratory data analysis for science. There's a problem. You're not going to cure it at the press of a button anytime soon. My canonical example is you want to cure cancer. You don't just program that in. It, it's divided up into many subtasks. It's complex. So that is only one of the use cases. Another use case, possibly one uh, that's more familiar to many journalists in the audience who are writing for the audience, is you want to present something that's known. And you want to use the visual system of the user in a way to present it more effectively. So you know what you're trying to get at, and the viz is going to help the reader see it, rather than you don't know where you're going. You're exploring along the way. Um, I'll also point out there's some interesting different use cases where viz is trying to work itself out of a job. And luckily, there's enough to do that we will not be hungry in the streets anytime soon. We can use it as a stepping stone. Maybe you are going to automate it eventually. Maybe you're at the stage where you don't even have a valid model yet, and you're trying to understand enough that you could do that. It's also sometimes interesting to use it where you do have an automatic solution, but you're not done building it, so you're refining it along the way. Um, or even you have to make sure that its intended audience trusts what it's doing. So a lot of these different use cases, I'm going to focus on these uh, first two of exploration and exposition in this talk. So the big idea in Viz is anytime we can, we want to swap in a perceptual act for a cognitive act. So we want to use some external visual representation in a way that actively helps us think that frees up mental resources for doing something other than getting low-level information out of the data set. Another thing that's important about this definition to me is that we have this idea that there's some awareness of what the task is and that we can talk about effectiveness, 
not just beauty. And so we can think about how would we measure effectiveness. And I'll talk about some of these issues as we go along. Uh, if you're interested in more of the motivation, uh, there's more in actually the first chapter of my book, Manish was kind enough to mention. Uh, and some of the ideas from that will be interspersed throughout. So the first vignette is a visualization tool for investigative reporting. This is Overview, uh, a system for visual document mining for investigative journalists. Uh, and this was a collaboration between two students in my own lab, Matt Bramer and Stephen Ingram, uh, and Jonathan Stray, who's sitting right up there and will be talking at you in the very next session. Um, so, and this was really my introduction to the world of journalism. So, let me tell you a story. The origin story of this system is basically WikiLeaks meets Glimmer. Um, so, I met Jonathan about uh, six years ago now, um, and he was really my entree into the world of the problems of journalism. Uh, and he was the first person I met who really had two hats, of a computational person and a journalist. And he was analyzing the Iraq war logs uh, from the WikiLeaks data set. And so this is one instance of this very general problem of too many documents and what do you do? Um, and his conjecture was that the labels built into this document set of how um, the Defense Department had categorized uh, these incident reports um, didn't actually show you everything there was to see in the data. There might be meaningful structure in there that we should be able to tease out using computational methods. Um, and he'd started from the point of he'd done a lot of natural language processing and was in search of better viz tools. And he ran across some work for my own group from a few years before, uh, which was a dimensionality reduction algorithm that used uh, the GPU to actually do things uh, more quickly than some previous work, where we were trying to scale up to about 30,000 documents and keywords in the documents. So there was this question of, oh, could we do better? Could we actually uh, get things further along by taking this particular task and putting it together with this kind of technique? So let me, for those who are not necessarily familiar with dimensionality reduction, I'll call that DR for short, let me walk you through the idea of what the goals are here. And this was the starting point of the collaboration. So the idea is we have this so-called bag of words model where we've got a lot of documents. You can think of these as rows in a very, very large table. And then uh, the columns of the table are every word that appears in any of the documents anywhere. And then if a word appears in a particular document, you've actually got the number of times it appears in that. So it's a very, very large table, and it's very, very sparse. There's a lot of zeros in this table. And so if you think about visualization, you don't just want to look at this table. It would be mind-numbingly boring, uh, not much better than looking at the numbers themselves. What we want to do is actually derive a new space in which to look at this. We want to project from this very, very high-dimensional space down to something where we can actually think about it. Uh, so typically, we're synthesizing new dimensions in, say, a two-dimensional space. And we're trying, the mathematical idea behind this is if you've got enough redundancy and structure in that data set, you can capture much of the variance, even though you're using far fewer dimensions to show that in. So you start out with this idea of reducing down to two dimensions, and then you say, okay, let me take these things in that two-dimensional space, look at them as clusters. And the hope is that this cluster structure in the 2D space would actually capture something of interest about the structure of the document set itself. And so you would typically, in terms of methods um, for showing this, you would often show this just as a relatively easy to understand scatter plot. So we're going from the high dimensional to the low dimensional data. Then we're taking that, we're drawing the scatter plot. Um, and then what might we do? Well, a very common thing to do is to say, okay, let's actually take a look at some of those points that represent documents, maybe read the documents, and then at the end of the day, maybe we can understand something about that cluster and come up with a label or a tag that's meaningful to us for the analysis we're currently doing. So that was the mindset of where things started. If you're curious about dimensionality reduction, it's a glorious topic. Um, uh, I'm not going to go deeper into it today, uh, but I do have a talk about many of the projects we've done in our own group, ranging from the algorithmic uh, to actually evaluating how people use these DR results. So let me show you an early version of this software. Um, the last tag set from this journalist covers disparate issues. We expand the disco tree to show smaller clusters as well. The journalist found issues he was not previously aware of, such as this cable which alleged Iranian plans to ship unmanned aerial vehicles to Venezuela. We now switch to another WikiLeaks data set the Afghan war logs from July 2009. 
we use Modisco tag to quickly tag these 3,000 documents. We assert that the first branch is about found IEDs when we look at the node labels in the active set list. We create the tag and add this node to it. The next branch appears to be about engagements. The abbreviations in these reports are INS for insurgents, COI for company, and SAF for small arms fire. The next branch is about fire missions. These branches form very tight clusters in the MDS view compared to the more diffuse layouts of the previous dataset. This group has labels with SALTER, the acronym for the After Action Report Format. We select a visible cluster in the MDS view and see that it corresponds to a branch in the DISCO tree. We tag this group of selected documents as detainee transfers. The combination of the DISCO tree, tagging, and a traditional MDS view supports machine-assisted human categorization to capture the concepts of semantic interest in document collections. So that was version one. Um, a few years later, there was a fairly different tool out there. Um, and it's not just a matter of taking a research prototype and turning it into actual robust code. One of the great things about this project is we did have funding from the Knight Foundation. Um, so let me actually show you a video of the much more uh, recent version. Suppose you're a journalist or a researcher and you've just gotten a hold of way too many documents. There's more than you could possibly read, maybe thousands of pages. Overview will read your documents and automatically sort them into folders based on topics. You also get full text search, a viewer for rapid reading, and a powerful tagging system for keeping track of what you've found. There are three ways to get your documents into Overview. If your documents are in PDF format, you can upload them directly. If you're a journalist, you probably already know Document Cloud, and Overview will import your projects directly. Overview can also read the documents from a spreadsheet file, and we have help explaining how to do that. Overview can process about a thousand documents a minute. When it's done, you begin your analysis at the root folder, which contains all documents. Each folder is labeled by the keywords from the documents filed in that folder. Overview tells you if most, some, or all documents contain each word or phrase. In this case, we have a folder where all documents contain the word letter and the phrases President Obama and gas exploration. So let's look at some of these documents. I can flip through them quickly using the next and previous buttons. And it looks like they're all of the same. It's a form letter. What happened here is 66 Congress people wrote a form letter to President Obama, and President Obama wrote 66 form letters back. We can tag this folder to keep track of what we've learned. Let's call it form letter. There, now it appears in the tree. This folder is a little less clear. No word appears in every document, so let's open it up. Still, we're looking at a folder which probably contains a bunch of different topics, so let's open it up again. Ah, now we've got a folder where every document has the word investigation and Atlantis platform. What this is, is an email thread about a citizens group which was asking for an investigation into the safety of a particular oil drilling platform called the Atlantis. So let's tag that too. Next to it are a bunch of emails about... Okay, so that's enough for now. It can give you a sense of not only the visual encoding, but the look and feel of the interaction. So what I want to talk about is why did this change? What was the rationale for this? Um, not, the screen looks quite different. There's not really the same number of views. The way in, within each view, things are different. So what was the rationale behind this? Um, and the idea was that we actually built a prototype and then deployed it and tried to see, well, how did people use this? And we went through and looked pretty carefully at uh, these case studies of the first six journalists who used this to do serious and interesting work. So here's one interesting question, which is, you know, what led us to think, well, is, is it really so crucial to deploy this? Um, so I want to talk you through a framework for thinking about 
this kind of real-world focused problem-driven work. Uh, so this is a collaboration with two uh, postdocs in my group, Michael Sadelmeyer and Mariah Meyer, on this methodology of what we call design studies in uh, the visualization world. And so between the three of us over about 15 years, we'd done 21 of these studies where we would dive into a domain, learn just enough about it to try to build viz tools to help. And so this ranged from genomics to in-car networks to computational linguistics to uh, the multicast backbone of the internet uh, to people's personal histories of listening to music. So quite a disparate set of fields. And one of the things I want you to notice is the little label underneath that viz system of the field it came from isn't super correlated with the picture we have of, well, how was the visualization system actually designed? What did that look like? So you can't just say there's a one-size-fits-all answer for a domain. And even within domains, often there's some very, very different things that you're seeing on the screen. So how is it that we could try to figure out to solve some problem um, in the real world? So what we tried to do is sit down and distill the experience both of doing our own design studies and um, also reviewing many papers and reading many papers by others and thinking systematically about what the lessons learned were. Um, and I'll mention that overview in investigative journalism very much falls into this domain of a design study. So one of the things we propose is a framework for thinking about this. I'm not going to walk you through this whole framework for reasons of time, but I am going to point out this idea that deploying a system to actually see how people use it uh, and then go back and change and think about how you should change the design of the software accordingly is one of the key principles of uh, this design study methodology. I'll also point out that there's one of the contributions of this kind of work can be understanding more clearly what the task is. It turns out to understand what people use it is necessary, but by no means sufficient to ask them. So they will not be the designers. Uh, they will typically not introspect in a way that tells you the complete story of what they do, and they retroactively think about what they have done in the past. So this idea of m moving a task from something that is fuzzily understood to something that's much more crisp is typically one of the contributions of this kind of work, and that's what I'm alluding to with these definitions along the vertical axis there. So we also talk about pitfalls. Many of them we learn the hardware. Only a few of them did we observe other people doing, not us. Um, and so not only do we talk about pitfalls, like deciding to collaborate too soon before you really understand uh, the problem, um, but we talk about it specifically how to avoid them in the paper in detail. So we were armed with this mentality that deploying in the real world was going to tell us something interesting and useful. Um, and that paper also talks quite a bit about the incentives of collaboration. And I think it's worth talking to this audience specifically about, you know, why is it of interest for computer science people to go off and learn about journalism? Um, and my answer is that you really, in general, when we work with someone in a domain, uh, we need to understand that driving problem. Because if we want to build tools intended to help people, it only works if you really understand the problems deeply enough, which might sound trivial, um, and yet, there's a lot of computer scientists that get very caught up into building tools without necessarily talking enough to the target users of those tools. And so typically what we do then as part of understanding what's happened is we observe you using them. So, you know, in order for us to do science, we need to observe. Uh, you are our honored, we can think of you as anywhere from guinea pigs to uh, test subjects in the wild. Um, you know, field work in, com in human computer interaction, HCI, doesn't involve going to the jungles of Borneo. It involves observing people at Google and in the newsroom. Uh, and this is literally what we call our field studies. And the thing is, if these tools are good enough, we get success stories that let us get our research published. And you guys get, in fact, access to better tools that are more customized for the things you want to do. And then the other part of that reward structure is that what makes this research in computer science is that we go think about what we did differently and develop guidelines for how to do this kind of work next time in the future. So I see this very much as a win-win reward structure for both sides when you do it in a way that actually aligns the incentives. And the paper talks quite a bit about how to make sure that those incentives are aligned in various contexts. So as I mentioned, we deployed this from the real, real world, and our goal then was to understand, given these questions people had, what were the underlying user goals? And that actually brings me to another framework, um, which is, uh, ah, okay. And so these goals actually ended up being a bit different. In, in some cases, they were not the goals we originally thought they had in mind. So we started from that first use case about the war logs. And then we found that some people were using it to do things like find the needle in the haystack, find the smoking gun. In fact, in one particularly tricky case, this was actually a story that led to the 2014, uh, one of the Pulitzer Prize uh, nominations, um, was trying to prove a haystack has no needles. 
a particularly interesting case. Did the government fail to pass bills on a particular topic? So this idea that you really want to focus on the user's goals uh, is part of another framework. Um, this uh, framework I call the nested model for visualization design and validation. Uh, and I want to walk you through just a few of the ideas in there as well. Uh, so the idea is it benefits us to think about four quite different levels of design. Um, the first one I'll call domain situation. So who are the target users? Now, one interesting point is what do I mean by that? And so to me in general, when I say domain, uh, I might mean genomics, I might mean physics, I might mean chemistry, and in this case, I mean journalism. So I apply this to many domains. But now, if you put yourself in the situation where you're thinking about the design of a visualization, typically your domain would be the topic of the story. So if you're writing a sports journalism story, then in that case, your domain is sports. So this is actually a sort of multifaceted idea. And then there's what I'll call the abstraction level. So in the abstraction level, what we want to do is translate from the specifics of a domain into something that is abstract across domains, it's generic, and it's in a language that helps us think about the design problems of visualization in particular. So I really want to focus often on what is being shown, the data, and that is an abstraction decision. Um, and then why is the user looking at that data? And that is what I'll call the task abstraction. So this focus on both data and task is a crucial part. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that often you don't just take the data you're given and draw that. You, guided by the task, might transform it into some other quite different form, such that when you draw that picture, you're helping with the user. So it's a very large design space. Then at the idiom level, this is what you might have thought of as sort of the viz problem. Sometimes these are called techniques or methods. What you want to think about is how are we showing this? And there's two sides of this often. There's the visual encoding part. How do you draw that picture? And then the interaction idiom, how do you manipulate that picture if you want to do something that's interactive rather than static? And then finally, it's useful to think separately about this final level of the algorithm design where you want to compute that efficiently in an automatic way. So there's this benefit of splitting things up into these four levels. And that benefit is that you can screw up differently at each level. So what are the threats to validity? Well, in the domain situation, we could get it wrong by completely misunderstanding the needs of the user. So it's not trivial to go from, here's a person embedded in the real world, to, well, here's actually the problem we're trying to solve with this tool. Now, at the abstraction level, you could actually show them the wrong thing. You could, for example, leave the data at the level that you uh, saw it without doing transformations, maybe that won't help. Sometimes you can just draw the data you're given, but by no means in all cases. So if you're showing them the wrong thing, then the most beautiful picture in the world will never be effective. Now at the idiom level, you could do something that simply doesn't work, and typically that's because you're misunderstanding about the human perceptual system, which is quite a subtle beast and often doesn't work in the ways we want. And I'll get to a few examples of that later on in the talk. And then finally, what's the hazard at the algorithm level? Your code is too slow. You've got an algorithm that's not effective. So the thing about why visualization is so interdisciplinary, and that might be of interest to this audience in particular, is that you are not given the arsenal of tools you need by a single field. Each of these levels needs to be evaluated using some pretty different methodological approaches. So I'm actually going to start from the inside out by thinking about this. At the algorithm level, what do we do to figure out if things work? Well, we use the methods of computer science. These are well taught in CS departments. How do you do computational benchmarks in a way that's valid, even for the more theoretically minded analyzing things like the computational complexity? This is quite well taught in computer science. A substantial amount of the work in visualization goes on at this level. I'll call that technique driven work. You start with an idea, you think about how to scale it up, uh, do it faster. Um, so if we just stay at this level, computer science serves us well. But what if we want to attack more levels than that? If we want to think about these problems of designing these idioms, not only do we want some methods from design, um, but also to test this, some methods that usually come out of cognitive psychology. Running controlled experiments in a lab where you're working with human subjects, you, with a stopwatch, see how long it takes them to do a thing, so you're measuring human time and error, not computer time and error. There's all kinds of complexities to dealing with humans in a way that's not usually well taught in a CS department unless you've got a strong HCI group. Um, so we're using those kinds of methods. 
But what about those other methods, those other levels of getting the domain and the abstraction right? Now, for that, we typically turn to fields like anthropology and ethnography in particular, where instead of trying to measure things in a lab where we tell people what to do and measure how long it takes them, we deploy it in the real world and look in the field and see, well, how are people's work practices changing? Uh, typically, these are more qualitative uh, approaches. Um, and one of the things that people often get wrong is they try to validate their technique at the wrong level. So they try to tell you why their idiom is good by telling you how long the algorithm took to run. It's an interesting question, but it doesn't prove that point. Or they try to show you that you've got the right abstraction by telling you about the results of a controlled experiment in a lab. But if you tell them what task to do to run the experiment, you can't check whether you got that task right. So that's something that's more suited for field study methods. So this kind of work where we start with the domain problem and go through the abstraction and the idiom levels before developing the algorithms, that kind of problem-driven work is usually called design studies, as I alluded to in that other paper. So what happened in the case of overview? So what happened was that we got a better understanding of the task abstraction as a result of looking at those case studies. We started out thinking that the task, abstractly speaking, was to generate a hypothesis and then explore this huge data set and summarize it with the idea that, well, of course, these data sets are far too huge to read everything, so we really need this tool to speed up the process of doing categorizing and counting. But then when we found what people did was they were using it for this quite different task of having a hypothesis that they needed to locate evidence for um, very specifically within the data set. And there were all these people that really, by God, did read every document. Um, and what they wanted was not the short circuit to avoid reading. They wanted something to help them track their findings. And that's what they needed the speeding up of. So, the way that both the data abstraction and then the idioms we use to encode this data changed in response to that more clear understanding of these multiple tasks, not just a single task, was for one thing, the way the cluster tree was arranged, we changed quite a bit. The early version focused a lot on the topological structure of that tree, that is the link structure. And in the end, the near final version, there's actually an even more updated version now, um, I showed you the version from 2014. Um, it's much more focusing on what's happening within the node so that we could show you what's happening within this entire cluster of documents. So a lot of room to do things like visually encode when it matches a tag. And so then the other insight was, even though we started from a place of wanting to show scatter plots of dimensionally reduced data, they weren't actually crucial. That for these tasks, for the combination of both, having a tree visualization based on this cluster structure and tagging did everything we needed to do and more than what we could see in the scatter plot. So there was no more DR scatter plot in that final version. And in particular, what we found was that the cluster tree actually was better at letting people traverse the document collection systematically by going from cluster to cluster. And so that was an interesting viz insight that we could then bring back to the field of viz even as we were making better tools for journalism. So those who are interested in the algorithm level, I'll point out, it's still a glorious problem. We were still interested in it, but that just was published in a different venue where we went deep into the algorithms. We now have um, quite a nice system for going even further with these kinds of large sparse data sets. I think they handle <clears throat> millions of documents where they really think about algorithmically dealing with that sparse structure, but that didn't go in this project. So those streams of research diverged, uh, and this was a spin-off paper with Stephen Ingram, the student that was interested in the algorithmic aspects. So that was one vignette. That was the story of exploratory data analysis for investigative reporting. Um, what about my next incursion into the world of journalism, which was a tool designed for the presentation problem? So Timeline Curator was a collaboration with Johanna Fulda and Matt Bramer. Um, and I'm going to actually start things out um, by telling you the origin story of this as well. And I have to admit, the origin story was being really irritated. So in particular, Johanna had been an infographics developer at Süddeutsche Zeitung, um, and then decided to go off and get a master's in computer science and came to UBC as a visiting student from Germany. And so when we thought about what pain point did she have in her own life that we wanted to try to address with interactive viz, um, and then adding some natural language processing into the loop, should sound familiar. This was remarkably like the place that Overview started with NLP meets Viz. What can we do to make the world a bit better? 
And so we addressed a particular pain point she had experienced directly. And let me actually show you a video to give you a sense of what this project is about. Timelines are a popular way of telling a story. They show important events, for example inside a biography, or they can give a temporal overview of a story. They let you see when it started, how events are distributed over time, and when it ended, or what the current state is. To create a timeline, you need a structured data set. That means find out what the important events are and filling them into a table. But this process is quite error prone and tedious. That's why we built Timeline Curator, a visual and browser based environment that lets you quickly generate timelines that are based on freeform text. So no editing tables, no searching for dates inside a long text, always having visual feedback. Let's look at how it works. This is Timeline Curator. To fill it with events, you can simply insert some text from anywhere, a Wikipedia page, a news article, a blog entry. You just copy the text and hand it over to Timeline Curator. It will find the temporal expressions and align them on the timeline. Now you can navigate through all the dates, delete them, edit them or change their date. So. The idea was that what happens if you want to make a timeline? So, you know, Johanna was in the situation where someone would fling something at her and say, okay, in 45 minutes we go to press, take this story, make a timeline out of it. Well, one thing you could do is do something completely manually, right? Where you actually take the story, grab the dates back out of it that maybe you were, uh, the, the journalist who actually developed the story was creating along the way, you know, that's a little slow too. And then you actually use something like Photoshop or Illustrator um, to make that. And then what happens when a couple of things need changing that basically requires doing a lot of things over from scratch? So not such a pleasant situation. Well, computers do exist. People have used them. But the problem is you have to get that data into the spreadsheet before you can use the nice tools. The good thing is that updating is much faster, uh, but extracting is still a point of pain. So what we wanted was something that actually gave you the ability to very quickly do things like browse which documents are even worth timelineifying, have the extraction and the formatting be quick, and then allowing this visual curation process for showing and updating the document. Now, this is actually a specific instance of a more general problem, which is this issue of curation. And when you want to build systems assuming that you will keep humans in that loop. And so it's back to this idea that automatic processing is not replacing the person, but ideally you're scaffolding them. And in particular, it's when you've got a computation result which is good enough to bother with, but not perfect, and moreover, you don't think it's going to be perfect any time in the near future. And if it gets really good, then the scope of what you want to do with it is going to expand, and once again, we're back to the imperfection. So the idea is, well, why don't we have visual feedback in the loop to try to accelerate this process? And that's what Timeline Curator was built to do, um, of trying to do a lot of the extraction automatically, but keep in mind it will not be perfect, so you want the human to quickly go in and edit that. And this actually points to an interesting idea, which is the importance of being brisk. That is, speeding things up. So when a lot of people in Viz talk about sort of what's Viz for, there's this super sexy use case of the Eureka moment. That you've got this Viz and it enables what could not be done before. And it's great. And when that happens, we're happy. And then we say, look, you used the Viz and you had this new insight. You couldn't have had it without the tool. You've discovered a thing. The world is a fabulous place. But in fact, the real workhorse is that you're speeding up something that people are doing already, but now you're letting them do it faster. And so it's important to keep that case in mind. It's probably the bread and butter of visualization. This is an idea I first heard about from Christian um, uh, Chabot of Tableau uh, at a vast keynote a number of years ago, and it really resonated me because uh, it turns out that is what a lot of our tools. And sometimes it could be that what you can do was totally infeasible before because speeding things up enough really can give you a qualitative shift into what's possible. So the use cases of TLC, Timeline Curator, we started up with that idea that we want to speed up presentations. And what was interesting is then once we built that, we had something that allowed us to not just make this document into a timeline right now, but also think about more exploratory use cases. So things like what if you want to compare multiple timelines? 
And even more to the point, what if you don't know whether it's even worth having a timeline? Is it worth comparing these two documents to each other? Does a document have interesting temporal information? And to show you that use case, I'll actually show a last bit of the video on speculative browsing. It can also be used for what we call speculative browsing. If you just quickly want to check if a document contains interesting temporal data at all, you can just copy the text, paste it in. Hmm, not interesting. Copy, paste. Ah, too little information. Copy, paste. Aha, uh -huh, that looks more interesting. So this was this exploratory use case that we came to after we started developing the tool a bit more. So those were my first two vignettes, walking you through two tools and some of the rationale and thinking behind them. Um, and now I want to shift gears a bit and think, OK, so what if you are confronted with a visualization problem that you personally need to solve? What are some of the issues you might want to be aware of, particularly where your intuition might lead you down a dangerous path that we've learned some lessons about in visualization? And I'm going to start out with the challenges of color. So here's a picture where life is not great. Um, and we should think about, well, what what is not so great about this? You know, we see infographics like this all the time on the web um, and in news settings. So there's a lot of things that are trying to be color coded here. And hmm, math and business studies look quite similar, as do visual arts and French. Uh, maybe this is not so good. So I might mention that a fabulous place to get unsuccessful visualizations is WTF is. Uh, their tagline is visualizations that make no sense, an excellent place to illustrate one's talk on these subjects. And I literally found this in under five minutes of looking on that site. In fact, I think it was under two minutes, sadly enough. How was color being used and how could you use color more effectively? This, in contrast, is from a great talk by Maureen Stone from the Tableau Col Customer Conference on the use of color in Tableau. And what we can see here is you can use color in two pretty different ways. At the top, we've got color used to show categories. These are different years and different things happened within them. And then on the bottom, we see color being used to really communicate something about ordering, really getting people to notice the 2010, then 2011, then 2012, then 2013. And that idea is even more clear in the graph on the right, where we really see that we've got a bar chart that's redundantly coded things in color. So we're length coding and we're color coding. And then we can see that in a chloropleth map, where we've got that same color coding, but this time in regions that are geographic, rather than bars in a chart. So what is going on here? The idea is there's something crucial we have to do when we think about color. The first rule of color is don't use the word color. Don't talk about color, it's going to confuse the heck out of you because if you treat it as a monolithic concept, you are going down the wrong path. So in particular, what we want to do with color is decompose that into three channels. Two of these channels communicate magnitude directly to your perceptual system so you can use them to usefully talk about ordered data. So if I gave everyone in this audience three chips of paint, and one was gray, and one was black, and one was white, and I said, put them in order. I will bet money that you would all put them in the same order. And the gray one would go in between the white and the black. Well, obviously, duh. OK, what if I gave you three paint chips, and one was white, and one was fully saturated pink, and one was kind of a pale pink? Well, you would put that pale one in between the white and the fully saturated pink. That's what we're talking about with saturation. But then there's this other way that we see color. I'm going to call that hue. Uh, and that might be what you think of when you colloquially say, like, what color is your shirt? My shirt is black, your shirt is pink, your shirt is blue. This hue aspect of the color really is communicating the identity of something. And it's good for showing categorical information. This is apples, this is bananas. Now, these channels have different properties. There's what do they directly convey to your perceptual system without conscious cognitive thought, and how much can they convey? How much information can you communicate using these channels? So let's think about luminance. It's a really interesting channel because that's actually how you see detail. You need luminance contrast to detect edges. So here's another picture from uh, Stone's talk where she's taken a picture and decomposed it into this luminance lightness information. That's where we're getting all the edges. And notice how the color information is actually much more sort of blobby. We're seeing color, but we're not really getting fine-grained edges. 
So one thing I'll mention is this is the underlying perceptual reason why you're told, you know, don't have blue text on a red background. You should have high luminance contrast for text. It's because you need to detect the edges. So don't just have hue contrast when you need legibility for anything, but particularly text. So luminance does have this intrinsic ordering that the grays are between the blacks and the whites. But what if we do want to show categories with color? You know, when we say color code, that's usually what we mean. There are a limited number of discriminable bins, right? Category, uh, levels in which to encode. So it turns out the human system is not a camera. The visual system actually does a lot of relative comparisons rather than absolute comparisons. So when color is next to each other, we have incredibly fine-grained ability to tell colors apart. So I'm going to pick on this poor paper from biology, but it's one of many examples, um, just like the one we saw before. So here they said, well, we're going to color code something about the mouse chromosome. Um, and so here's the legend. This is on the mouse chromosome. We're going to use a different color for every one of these. Um, and you can actually see quite fine-grained distinctions between these colors, right? There's different shades of green, but you can tell the difference when they're right next to each other. But things start to go wrong when we use that to encode on the human chromosome the place where these genes have moved to in terms of evolutionary um, change. And so, okay, let's start in that upper left on chromosome one. Well, we've got tan, we've got, well, what's that? Maybe some kind of blue. We've got brown, we've got green, we've got white, we've got red, we've got, oh, well, there's definitely some, uh, light blue, purple, orange -ish. I'm, I have not run out of fingers, but I have run out of the ability to notice the difference between those colors when they are small, non-contiguous regions because we're bad at absolute comparisons. So these small, non-contiguous regions, the sad story is there are fewer bins than you want. Everybody wants to color code more than they can get away with. The rule of thumb is in general, unless you are working with extreme care, you can maybe get between six and 12 bins. And remember that includes the background, it includes the neutral color, it includes any kind of highlight color. So there's a lot of difficulties in using color to encode. And so your response to this might be, but well, what do I do? I thought you're telling me how great the visual system is and I want to encode information in it. So what are things I can do if you're telling me I can't color code 20 things? So that actually brings us to another idea about visualization, which it's really useful to think about it in, with these visual encoding idioms in terms of this theory of marks and channels. So when I say mark, I mean some kind of geometric object in zero dimensions, it's points. In one dimension, it's lines. In two dimensions, it's areas. And what we can do with these marks is we can use them to convey information through these different channels where we're controlling the appearance in a way that can communicate information to you. We can use spatial position, either horizontal or vertical or both together. We can use color coding like we just talked about. We can use shape coding. We can have orientation encode something. We can size code with either length or angle or even in the 3D case, we'll hear more about 3D later, but with volume. So this idea of analyzing the visual appearance, it's crucial to then think about these channels. They have different properties, just like we saw luminance and saturation were different than hue. Well, they all have these differences in the way that they're conveying information to humans perceptually with how many different levels can we discriminate and are we showing this ordered information or this categorical information? Are we showing magnitude or identity? And how accurately can we perceive them? So to cut to the chase and give a bit of a spoiler, there's been a lot of research on this. There's actually decades and decades of interest in the psychophysics of how people respond to perceptual stimuli and to visualization in particular. And so one of the key things is this idea that the expressivity should match. If you have data that's intrinsically categorical, you should use these identity channels. And he was only one of them. There's shape coding. There's even things like the motion. Um, and in contrast, if you've got ordered data, uh, then you really want these magnitude channels that are implicitly communicating magnitude to you. So, well, why? Well, if you get that wrong, you do one of two kinds of errors. If you use ordered data, if you use an ordered channel to show unordered data, then, well, what are we doing? We are conveying something that's not in the data, that's basically arbitrary. 
And what if we go the other way? What if we have ordered data and we show it with an unordered categorical perceptual channel? Well, now suddenly we've lost data. So we either mislead or we lose in ways that are problematic. Now, one thing I'll also mention is these are not arbitrarily ordered. We're actually going from top to bottom in terms of perceptual effectiveness. So they are not all created equal. Um, if we had more time, I would get into some of the underpinnings behind this, a uh, very fun subject. Um, for now, I'll leave it at, there is a lot of research that talks about accuracy of ability to perceive, and some of these ones about spatial position um, are the very strongest, and uh, so this is distilling a lot of information. And typically what you wanna do is use the most effective ones. If you've got multiple attributes of your data you're trying to show, use the more effective channels to show the most crucial part. And that ties back into the task of the task affects what the most crucial parts of your data set to show are given what they're trying to do with it. So there's this idea that we don't, as I mentioned, necessarily just draw what we're given. Uh, we decide what the right thing to draw is. And Deriving is one of the major strategies for handling complexity because marks and channels are the first part of that picture. And one of the things we might choose to do is don't just color code what we're given, derive new information such that when we color code that, we actually have a chance of doing it. Um, this actually dates back to the very earliest uses of line charts where uh, Playfair said if we don't just have the imports with the exports. If we want to directly show that number as the trade balance, you can just read that off from your perceptual system. So let me show you an example motivated by some of the stuff we just heard about a lot yesterday, which is election data. Um, so let's think about doing something fairly sophisticated. Uh, so it turns out in the UK, the ballots are alphabetically ordered. Now the government says that's just fine, doesn't matter, nope. People with names in the A's and B's are not more likely to get elected with people whose names are lower in the alphabet. And some visualization researchers were not convinced that this was true. And the challenge is how do you convince people like policymakers, maybe even the general public, that this is a problem? It's a sort of nuanced question. And so that task was to compare the geographic regions of voting and the spatial position of the candidate's name on the ballot. And they did have this data set of the Greater London elections from 2010. And this data set has a lot of data in it. It's got geographic location, it's got the candidate name, the alphabetical position in the ballot, the number of votes, which party they were in, did they get elected, did they lose? And so if you just try to take that data set and color code it, this is not going to go well. You've got, we're gonna be in that exact problem I talked about before, okay, you know, there might be 12, 20 people on the ballot. You can't just color code that directly. So what they did is they derived new data. They said, well, let's think about the alphabetical position of a candidate within the slate of the party and their vote order of how many votes they got within their party. And what that allowed them to do is to actually then, now we can color code some things. We've got a different data set uh, that's transformed from the original. And then you can make arguments that name order bias exists in geographic regions where there is systematic structure in the bar lengths. And they've actually divided this up into the different boroughs of London. And the answer, of course, is geographically nuanced. Unsurprisingly, these were cartographically informed researchers who did care about geography. And it turns out geography does matter. And in some election districts, you do see the structure. And in other districts, you don't. Um, for those who are interested, it's a lovely paper. I strongly uh, recommend people go have a look. Um, that's all I'm going to say about it for now. It's just an example of doing something interesting with deriving new data. What I do want to mention is that this idea of deriving new data is one of four strategies to handle complexity. Um, so there's deriving this new data. There's also things like making the view interactive, changing it over time, manipulating it in some way. There are strategies for having multiple views often linked together with interactive highlighting, um, of faceting into more than one view, not trying to have a single view shoulder all of the perceptual burden of communicating. And then there's reducing within a single view how much you show, either some kind of filtering or aggregation. So I'm not gonna go deeper into these other methods today, but if your curiosity is piqued, then I will point you to more resources later for thinking about these kinds of things. So instead what I'm gonna do is switch gears to my last vignette, which is thinking about the difficulties of depth. And this is another one of my cautionary tales about what have we learned in visualization that might not be totally intuitive. So there's this question of, well, so I've got this data and there's a lot of it and there's you know, multiple attributes to show. So you know, I could show it in 2D, but wouldn't it just be better to show it in 3D? Because after all, there's one more dimension and more dimensions equals better, right? Now, 
Slogans like 2D good and 3D better should remind you of some other slogans. And four legs good, two legs better did not turn out so well for Animal Farm. So let's see where this analogy brings us. There's a lot of the use of 3D that is unjustified. And again, one of my favorite sites, uh, WTF Viz, uh, shows us two examples of the kinds of things you do see on the web and in the news quite a bit. And I'm sure many of you are cringing, but let's try to decompose why. What, what is wrong here, um, besides some dubious color? But I'm particularly interested in the use of 3D and what the issues are. So this is where I'm gonna bring you back to that list of channels. And what you might not have noticed at the time, you know, I talked about spatial position as the highest accuracy. That's only planar spatial position. That is the X and Y plane. Once we think about depth, which is position in 3D, that's actually much, much lower ranked. So we perceive depth differently, the 3D spatial position into the scene, differently than horizontal and vertical spatial position. So that high accuracy is not for 3D, it's for 2D. Why is this? And I'm actually gonna borrow a phrase from Colin Ware, who has some great books on visualization and perception. Um, we don't, you think you live in 3D, but actually you don't. You don't even live in 2.5D, you live in 2.05 dimensional space. And what he means by that is if you move your eye, you can actually see things within the image plane, but into the scene, when I actually have the ray for my eye go out, I can't see what's behind Jonathan because he's occluding it, he's blocking it. For me to resolve that occlusion relationship, either he would have to move or I would have to move, right? Now I can move my head and I can see things. So this is actually a much slower acquisition route. There's a real systematic difference between the plane and depth. What are some of the consequences of that? Occlusion hides information. So you can spin things around to try to resolve those different occlusion relationships, but that adds time, that adds cognitive load. So the other problem is that many people think about perspective as one of the great achievements of humans, but for a vis person, Perspective is not such a great thing because in particular that perspective distortion where far away things look smaller completely obliterates your ability to size code things. So heights, as things recede on a 3D plane, you can't just directly compare um, in the plane anymore. So there's a lot of issues with perspective distortion and occlusion. So in short, if I'm gonna give you one bit of free script advice, please, no 3D bar charts. But let me tell you something a little more nuanced. So I'm gonna show you an example. This is the what not to do figure from a paper that I love about showing time series data. And what they point out is the obvious thing that might occur to you is if you have a time series, you might say, oh, I could extrude a year's worth of those into 3D and look at a whole year, year's worth of data at once. Now, what can you see from this? You can see this is actually over time in one direction and then the days of the year in the other direction. It's the power usage in a building. And you can see that, you know, at night people aren't in the building, in the daytime they are. In summer they use less power than in the winter. This actually starts in January and, and goes back. So you can see some large scale structure. But if I told you, okay, compare 10 a.m. on Tuesday, February 5th to 3 p.m. on Wednesday, November 19th, you are doomed. This visualization does not help you with that question. So what could you do instead? This comes back to this idea of deriving and transforming your data and having multiple views. So what they said is let's compute a hierarchy, let's cluster these time series, show a representative one for each cluster, and link it to a view that's really good at showing time, which is a calendar, very specifically designed for showing temporal patterns. And so what we see here are some things where, for example, that line across the bottom, well, that's weekends. This is actually a Dutch calendar, so we've got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Thursday, Friday, vertically, and then Saturday, Sunday on the bottom. So we can definitely see weekends versus weekdays. We can see sort of days during the winter as these very high use days. Um, and then there's also some interesting questions about, I think this is a laser pointer. No, that's a clicker. Uh, all right, no lasers for me. Um, so what we can see is there start to be some other patterns, days that there are fewer people in. For example, during the summer, fewer people are in than during the winter. Fridays in the summer, even fewer yet. Days in between holidays, uh, very few people. And then there's some interesting days like December 5th, that one bright red one, that's an odd outlier. And we look uh, at the cluster view and then we see it appears to be that people leave work an hour early. 
How odd. Well, it turns out in the Netherlands, December 5 is called Santa Claus Day. You get to leave work a day, uh, an hour early. That's just what one does on that day. That kind of phenomenon you would not see in the previous 3D extruded view. So this carefully designing maybe linked 2D views uh, with interaction can actually give you quite a lot of power. So when is 3D good? It's when we can actually justify 3D in terms of very commonly that the shape of something matters. Your data is intrinsically three-dimensional spatial data, and then your ability to understand its spatial structure is the whole point of the visualization. Because in this case, the spatial structure is not the choice of the viz designer. It's implicit in the data itself. Ah, thank you. Um, so in this case, um, we're actually looking at, say, fluid flow in a 3D volume, and that spatial structure uh, of the shape is what we want to see. So there's some very justified uses for 3D, particularly with spatial data. But what I want people to be careful of is don't have unjustified 3D. And in particular, if your data is abstract in terms of a network or a point cloud, be very careful. The Viz literature used to have a lot of 3D network diagrams. Uh, I got my start in Viz in 1990s, in my defense, the early 90s, with a lot of that. These days, there's quite a lot of skepticism. People have done empirical studies on some of the difficulties of perception. I believe this was the last 3D network paper to be published in the InfoViz literature. That was 99. Um, obviously, the use of color might also need some help here, too. Um, but the point is, this kind of view was not so effective for this abstract data. Now, here's what I want to point out. It's not that all use of 3D is unjustified. In fact, there was some beautiful work from the New York Times that very carefully used 3D, and it was for abstract data. But what I want people to note is this is actually not just something where it's completely unconstrained navigation. I'm actually going to just take a moment uh, to click through. Um, so in this... One thing to notice here is as we go through these views, there's a lot of actually careful navigation here. Um, we're explicitly looking at different views of it. Notice how some of these views end up being the kinds of 2D views so we can see the structure. We're zooming in and seeing some parts in particular so there's constrained navigation techniques. Uh, so there's some very careful curation of the views and navigation for the users through this so they can see these relationships in that data set. So it is possible to use 3D for abstract data if you're careful. So I'm not saying never use 3D, but I am saying be careful to justify your use of 3D if you're going to use it. So to wrap things up, I gave you a tale of two tools. And one was for exploration, the overview tool, in collaboration with several folks, including Jonathan Stray. And I really talked about these methods and rewards for collaboration. I like these Matt Groening, uh, you can guess who's who here, uh, who likes tech, who has lots of documents. Um, what are some of the rewards for successful collaboration between these two groups? Um, and some ways to reason about the issues in visualization design. And I also talked about a tool for presentation, Timeline Curator. Um, and there really this general idea was how do you imperfectly how do you deal with computations that's imperfect? You can have humans curate those results visually. And this idea that sometimes what you want from Viz, in fact, usually what you want from Viz is to speed things up rather than have this uh, glorious but maybe a little more difficult to achieve eureka moment. And then I gave you two cautionary tales about how it is that color in 3D, your intuitions might lead you astray, and you really do want to think um, about learning from the decades of work in visualization on how it is that we can use these perceptual cues effectively. So uh, this talk itself uh, is up online. Um, if people are curious about more of the ideas, uh, Manish did mention there is this book that goes into some more detail on some of this. And of course, speaking of more detail, uh, there's a lot of work that we do in my own group that's available, um, not only papers, but also lots of videos, a fair amount of interactive software, um, and some full courses on visualization that are all available either at the group page or my own personal page. And now, I would be delighted to take questions. Thanks for your attention. I believe there's mics. However, motor control is difficult this early in the morning. It is early. Um, so there's a very systematic layout of sort of all the design, of the abstract design dimensions and 
you know, the immediate thought that comes to mind is um, automating that decision process or maybe along the way making, you know, wizards to help people before automation. So what's, what's the progress on that? I mean, I assume people are working on that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. This idea of marks and channels, that was one of the earliest papers in the Viz literature. It was 1986 from Jock McKinley. And he came out of an AI department. And his goal was exactly automating all of this. And so a fair amount of the early work in Viz was about this idea of, well, but if we could articulate this, surely we can automate this. And the short answer is, well, it's tricky. And in particular, the parts of the design space that we understand well. Like at this point, we can automate some choices, like should you use a bar chart or a line chart? So some of the more common statistical graphics are well understood enough that we can actually m automate that trade-off space. Huge parts of viz design are not well enough understood, and there are probably still decades of research that are required for questions like, you know, when should you switch from this idiom to that idiom in terms of how many pixels you have on screen and what the user's task is. So the goal of Viz is to have the big book in the sky where you say, this is exactly my data and task, and you look up and you choose your adventure on page 593 and it tells you, use this. And there has been some progress, you know, Jock's now at Tableau, part of their work there was to have the show me button that at least tries to constrain the set of possibilities based on your data. It's more based on the data than on the task. So it is a long-term holy grail to be able to say, for this data and this task, do that. It's going to take a while. And part of what I argue is that abstraction level of even understanding what that task is is non-trivial. So well, we think, want it, but we're not there yet. Yeah, I think also, actually, there's the issue of if you present it to people, could they even understand it? You know, I mean, to users, if you say, this is the task I think you're doing, would they recognize that as describing the thing that they think they're trying to do? But anyway, I've been outed as an AI person. Excellent. Hello, I have two brief questions. One is whether the ranking you described in your presentation is from the Cleveland and McGill paper on? In part. So Cleveland and McGill was some of the fundamental research that went into that. Um, some of that's been replicated, but even more importantly, extended. So certainly that, that 86 Cleveland, actually 84 Cleveland and McGill paper is a glorious paper. Everyone should run out and read it. Um, but there's been quite a lot of work since then, uh, for example, that adds more visual channels that gives us some nuance on those. Uh, but that was, if you read only a single paper on that, it's Cleveland and McGill. Thank you. Yeah, um, I tweeted that paper. But Good. also, yeah, I had been yeah, <laughs> hoping to hear about whether there's an update, because we have learned a lot more about visual perception since then. And then my other brief question is whether you know of a guide that exists for newsrooms who want to um, use both, say, an interactive online and then as a teaser, maybe a print edition of that. And do you know of a resource for people who want to use a palette amenable to print and online if they can? Uh, color palette? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the short answer is uh, Color Brewer. That's C-O-L-O-R-B-R-E-W-E-R -E -E is a great resource. Um, there's also some nice color palettes like Viridis, uh, which are also color um, both kind of Black and white print friendly or color friendly are also colorblind friendly, a whole other issue I didn't have time to get into. So there are some nice palettes out there. Um, and, uh, and I've got some links on some of my course pages to tools like that if people want to look in more detail. Yes. Uh, hi, that was a brilliantly lucid uh, exposition of, of the visualization stuff. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, my, my questions around the, the role of text in visualization um, and your thoughts on it from two perspectives. One is um, text from the compositing and layout point of view. Um, if you look at the development of the web over the past 30 years, it looks a lot like the, the development of news, newspaper uh, publishing over the past 250. Um, it's really fascinating how these things have gone in the same place and just the visualization of the text for readability and highlighting the important pieces. Um, and then the flip side of that that I think relates more directly to what you're talking about is the, what's the role of labels and text blocks and um, uh, things that you can't really visualize but you have to write down and explain in the middle of the, the diagrams? So let me do the last one first because it's in my head now, which is what's the role of sort of textual annotation in his diagrams? And the soundbite version of it is annotation is what makes a pretty picture into something that's actually conveying information. It's, all, it's typically very crucial that you have some kind of text labels 
as to guide the user through what, what is this thing that, that you have visually encoded. And that can range from fairly simple annotation blocks you know, to full-on legends to you know, long descriptions of what is it that they're seeing. So I think it's crucial. Um, and I think that you know, the question of, so there's the fundamental question of you do need textual annotations in many contexts. And then there's this more sort of what I'll call graphic design question of, and how do we actually fit that in in a way that works? There is a little bit of support in Viz tools for doing things like automatic labeling. Some of that comes out of the computational geome geometry literature by way of cartography, where they're trying to say, well, if you've got all these labels, and obviously you can't show all of them, how do we pick one, which ones to show, particularly in a way that works nicely interactively so that as you zoom in, you don't get a lot of blinking in and out, but you get the more important things. So there's some algorithmic solutions if you have a dense variety of labels and you're trying to automatically find some good ones. But I think a lot of what people are doing for presentation graphics is a much more hand-tuned thing of, well, there's the viz, and then I'm actually going to position text blocks within it. Uh, and then you're thinking more about things like, you know, there, uh, in fact, there's, there's some nice work that comes both out of Fiquette's lab. Um, Manisha's group has also done quite a bit about these problems of how is it that you could actually design diagrams in a way that really works well, whether it's an exploded view kind of a diagram or have the labels around the periphery rather than sort of cluttering things up. So there's been some work in that, but I do think that the state of the art for a lot of people still comes down to, you know, in the worst case, adding uh, labels to things completely post hoc where you dump something out of the Viz tool and do labeling. There's some really nice work from Mariah Meyer's group at Utah that talks about going back and forth between automated tools and something you do in Illustrator. So her point was when you talk to real designers, a lot of them say, oh, but the tool, you know, these automatic tools don't do what I need. At the end of the day, I export to Illustrator to fine tune the labels. But then if you want to go and rerun something in the thing, you would have to start from scratch. So I think her paper just at this year's Viz, or InfoViz in a couple of weeks in Baltimore, is about a system that lets you go back and forth between the automated and the hand labeling and preserve the information on but both that's, sides. That's more like your timeline curator where you're Yeah, applying. but it's a more general system for going back and forth between um, so where you take something like in D3 and in Illustrator and you're trying to have Illustrator and D3 play nice with, with each other. Yep. Hi, what are, you, what are your thoughts on, especially in journalism, the tension between making something that looks interesting um, versus trying to best, uh, or, you know, distill a visualization down into what is most essential to convey that information? Right. Uh, there's quite a bit um, on that. So basically there's, you know, there's this accuracy of the perceptual channels. And if you always went by that, your world would have a lot of bar charts in it. And bar charts are a thing of glory, uh, and there are many uses for them. But there's also things that might be perhaps more expressive, even if they're not quite as perceptually accurate. So there's this tension and this interplay. Um, if we'd had longer, I would have talked about some things like, you know, when do you use radial layouts versus rectilinear layouts? So the short answer is there's some things that you might choose to do for exploration uh, that if you really just cared about accuracy, you might do first. When you're doing something that's more about a narrative point, you might have a bit more breadth of looking for things that are maybe more evocative. And what we want to do is not throw out the ability to read the graphic completely but there's sometimes some space for more innovation. So I would say it's a trade-off space, like pretty much every other design decision. Um, there's some parts of that space where you do not want to go. Um, but in general, you can think about both sort of evocativeness and accuracy, and you want some combination of the two. So sometimes familiarity breeds, if not contempt, at least a bit of boredom, and you want to do something that's going to draw the user in. Uh, we actually have a paper that's just coming out um, on uh, the design space of timelines because we got interested in that uh, with the Timeline Curator Project, where we really did think about what happens when you use timelines to tell stories, not just to explore your data. So we talked quite a bit about that in that new paper. I'll stick a pointer to it up on my webpage very shortly. Manish. All right, thank you, Tamara. <laughs> Let's thank the speaker again. Thanks. <laughs>